Yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. All right. So uh, welcome this afternoon to the introduction to the dual small form factor for OCP NIC 3.0. My name is Thomas Singh. I'm a platform architect at Intel, and I'm also the editor of the specification. Hey, everyone. Uh, Johansson Vasquez. I'm a uh, thermal mechanical systems engineer at Intel and uh, mechanical work stream lead. And I'm uh, Jason Rock. I work at Dell Technologies. I'm a hardware systems architect. I've been helping out with the OCP NIC for several years now. Uh, I'm Dell's representative for it. Uh, last year, we, uh, in 2023, here at the OCP Global Summit, introduced the concept of a new form factor called the dual small form factor. Today, we currently ship what's known as the small form factor. This looks like, as uh, Joe's going to hold up here, this specific form factor. It's really taken off. What it ultimately enabled was removing a fixed LOM on a server, which many companies between this point were doing a lot of customized versions of a removable daughter card, and building a, basically an interoperable standardized solution that both system integrators as well as NIC vendors um, could design it and support. Okay, actually, so um, really quick, as far as the work stream goes, we split the work up into three. Three, so yeah. The electrical that I led, Joe led the mechanical work stream, and Jason led the SI work stream. Um, maybe with that, we'll hand it over to Joe and you give a little bit of background on mechanical. Yeah, thanks. So. We uh, really had a goal with DSFF of um, compatibility. We had two goals. Uh, first was we wanted to fit within the MFLW platform custom zone. Um, also, the MSDNO uh, custom zone, but the MFLW was the more restrictive of the two, so that really drove our pitch, um, our, our definition of our card. The other goal was we wanted to be able to fit two SFFs, so to be able to have that compatibility to go from a single DSFF to, if, if the chassis so chose, um, two SFFs individually. Um, and that would be achievable with a removable guide rail. So that was kind of how we started uh, on that path. Uh, and we wanted it to be scalable. So really the goal of DSFF was to um, have greater IO capability, um, both for foundational NICs and also for smart NICs. And when we get into the thinking about smart NICs, we really also wanted to try and include, increase our thermal design freedom um, by having a larger form factor where we could have more cooling um, with, you know, with a heat sink. Uh, you can see on the screen here a couple different examples. This is an MFLW board uh, showing either the DSFF uh, on the left um, or uh, where you could have two SFFs in, in, the, in that same form factor, same area. Uh, something new kind of uh, as we were going through this is um, there were some requirements. So there was an ask uh, that we increase the single integrity capability um, by being able to move the PCIe caps closer to the edge of the gold fingers. Um, so how we decided to do this was to move away from what was the, the insulator. The only option was a plastic flexible insulator. Um, and we moved to the option of having a rigid backing plate. Um, I think this actually has it. Yeah. Just something like this here. So you would have a rigid backing plate. We still have the same um, Insulator. Restriction on the bottom as far as, far as bottom height goes. Yeah. Uh, but this give, allows us to protect those caps so we move them closer to the gold fingers. Also, you know, it offers opens up some capability for if you want to, uh, you know, for mechanical reliability. Uh, if you want to tie your thermal solution into that somehow, um, it really gave us that. Yeah, I just want to add to that. The reason why we have this thermal insulation is you have to think about it. This is meant to be coplanar with an HPM motherboard, and so there's millimeters of room between. The, the motherboard and the bottom of the chassis. We want to ensure there's no connectivity shorts. Yeah, I think you, you get two millimeters as your max bottom component height, so it's, it's, it's tight. <laughs> uh, so this gives a little bit more freedom with that, um, and we've out, laid that out in, in the spec. And uh, we've also made it so going forward, if you want to do an SFF with that design, uh, with a backing plate, you now have that, that, that opportunity. Yeah, a lot of just uh, really quick, a lot of the things that we're going to show off for DSFF today is totally backwards compatible for applying this to a SFF as well. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, just today's show off is for the DSFF. All right. So this is, uh, as, as you may have saw, so this is, this is the new dual small form factor. Um, it's compatible with both the MFLW and MSDNO 
um, custom platform zones. Um, we've aligned the pitch for those. Uh, we've also, you know, we're now allowing, you, you could go from this to two SFF cards. Um, we've done a lot to, you know, we added the backing plate, um, we've updated all of the CAD files, provided all those on the website, uh, 2D drawings, example 3D CAD, uh, the shock and vibe fixture, we've also made those updates, so um, you have the option of either keeping, if you have an existing shock and vibe plate, you can make modifications. Uh, so, or uh, there's a new extended version. If you're going to go ahead and build a new shock and bite plate, you can go ahead and uh, do that new design. Um, something that now we're kicking off is we've taken care of um, the mechanicals, you know, the electrical, um, the signal integrity. The next big step that we need to do is work on the thermal side of things. Um, so we've kicked off that work stream now that we've sunset the mechanical, um, and that's really going to be the work going forward is to think about um, what's what's next for thermals? You know, there's some things in the spec that need to be updated um, as far as um, thermal guidance and, and charts, uh, some simulation kind of guidance, um, and then also we'll be talking a lot about you know what's the future? Um, how do we uh, inter entertain uh, you know liquid cooling or, or better air cooled solutions? Um, while at the same time also um, defining, finishing the design of the thermal test fixture um, and getting that thermal model going. Yeah, yeah. Well, here in about an hour, myself and a few others will be discussing the thermal test fixture and some of the other test methodologies that we have with the OCP NIC. Great, thanks Joe for the mechanical updates. So hopefully, uh, you know, you'll come up to our Innovation Village later and we'll discuss further in depth. I know there's a short presentation here, but let's talk about the electrical updates really quick, right? As Joe mentioned, this is really an opportunity to deploy two foundational NICs in a server at deployment time and provide the opportunity to upgrade to a smart NIC. So a single DSFF or two SFF slots fitting in the same compatible HPM motherboard that was just shown a little bit ago, right? DSFF enables 32 lanes of PCIe at Gen 6 rates. Um, and really, this is similar to that of the LFF, those of you that know the spec from years past, right? But really, this is also staying within that same idea of a single power domain. We get to pull 12 volts from both the primary connector and the secondary connector. It's really 160 watts, so 80 watts a piece per connector, but about 150 watts usable power once you start considering the t uh, power balancing you know, tolerances between both of them. Power limits is based on the available budget that the baseboard will define um, and reading the fru EEPROM on the card. Uh, let's talk about management and control. So because we have two connectors, we really want that control plane to be only on the primary connector. If you look at that photo in the upper right hand corner of the screen, you see the sideband for SM bus, RBT, that's the NCSI bus, as well as the scan chain, and then the uh, three power signals, aux power enable, main power enable, and NIC power grid. That only happens on the primary connector only when you have a DSFF. So for manageability wise, we still get our tried and true interface RBT, that's NCSI. You know, the, the community has rallied around that for a long time but you get other options such as MCTP over USB, SM bus, and PCIe VDM. USB for manageability on a DSFF is now, I believe we said mandatory, right? This is yeah. gonna be an option for higher speed management. And really that opens up for futures, a slide from Jason in a little bit about Flex IO, right? This shows up as a single FRU. It's still a single FRU EEPROM with OEM records that we re recently defined for DSFF. This is, allows us to declare to the baseboard, you are uh, DSFF, you may or may not have Flex IO, and your PCIe link subdivision. Some of the challenges you had, uh, Thomas, was uh, we had to also negotiate a lot of that with the uh, DCMHS group and ensuring that the FLW is gonna be able to conform and operate. Absolutely, so okay. working with the FLW and SDNO work groups and MHS, it's been a wonderful experience, actually getting something that we all yeah. agree upon, right? Right. So let's talk about PCIe link subdivision, subdivision really quick, also known as bifurcation. So in the previous incantation for SFF and LFF, we had this very, very static table. We heard some complaints about this from the community, and it was hard to look up, right? The baseboard would have to uh, have its own lookup table, figure out what the intersection of the BIF pins and present pins really meant for bifurcation. Whereas here, for DSFF, we hope to improve that a little bit. Um, 
supported bifurcation is now listed in the OEM record on the card. Uh, what that really entails is we move away from that static table. This is a much more descriptive framework for the HPM to query the NIC on what we support on the NIC side, and it also opens up uh, opportunities for both endpoint and root port uh, topologies. All right, this is required for DSFF. Uh, like I said a little bit ago, you could backwards port this to SFF and it'd still be compliant to the spec. So how this generally works is you plug in a card, you figure out your present pins and code a certain way. In this case, the bits 0010, 0010, it detects itself as a DSFF card. Next thing you do is go ahead and read the OEM records that describe your PCIe link subdivision. So either for, uh, in this example, you see four modes, you know, two by 16, a four by eight, eight by four, and a, a mixed mode, like by 16 and two by eights, right? This is described in that OEM record. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but there's an OEM record in there that describes all this, um, that associates the number of lanes, the number of controllers, what ref clock you use, as well as first, okay? Yeah. So one of the other areas that we added as part of the electrical, uh, you can hang on to that for the moment, was the electrical spec was the uh, inclusion of new timing sync uh, features within the OCP NIC. Um, if you look at the size of an SFF uh, today, which I have in my hand, uh, it basically can support like either two QSFPs or four SFPs in the front, and only pretty much about enough room for a LOM controller in, in, in the rear side of it. There's not much else left room for things like memory and other things, but one of the things that the DSFF gives us as part of the uh, form factor is it gives us enough PCB space to be able to support what was already done on half-length, full-height cards. Um, and in today, there are a couple of vendors that actually support timing-sensitive NICs or telecom-type NICs that have PLLs and OCXOs. Um, I have a presentation on this tomorrow in the TAP group, and tomorrow morning I'll go into this further. But we wanted to also include a feature set that's been both a benefit and a challenge uh, with the OCP platform that to do propagate timing synchronization, you do have to propagate at minimum time, which is like PTP, as well as potentially frequency, which generally is synchronous ethernet. Um, most people today with current NICs do that with external cabling, either on the board itself, like in, in sort of embedded connectors like U.FL or a, a Molex type Pika connector, or even on the front end of it, um, like SMA cables. And cabling, especially when you're talking about big deployments of servers, is it's very challenging to do, and it's also a big customer pain. And so we wanted to introduce this feature that now that USB is part of the specification, we're trying to, as, as we brought up, RBT has been our management interface, 100 megabit, for quite a while now. But the fact now that we have a USB interface and can go up to 450 megabits, we do want to help encourage some interoperability and scalability where we can re-leverage those pins as flex I.O. So you can kind of see, if you can read it in the slide, there's frequency, sync, as well as a, a general purpose pin in both ingress and egress directions. Um, we defined uh, a specific frequency like 10 megahertz and one pulse per second, as well as you want the amalgam of like an EPPS, which is both a 10 meg and a one pulse per second. Those are all defined by the specification. It is now officially released. Um, other people can do vendor defined. We have that capability within the EEPROM that you can do that. But this is kind of a new feature. It's both supported with DSFF and then technically SFF as well, because we have to maintain that backward compatibility. Right, that's exactly right. Also, maybe one more thing. Um, hardware traceable clocks. You know where your clock is coming from now. You're not cabling within your system, and it's not a service True. really nightmare. That's exactly right, yeah. Um, so the other end, uh, my work stream was the, the signal integrity. Again, we had the same goal. It has to be backward compatible, both to SFF, but also since we have to work with FLW and SDNO, um, it has to be able to support backward compatibility um, to the same channel budgets, more or less. And I will tell you, <laughs> you know, from the NIC point of view, I can see Intel here, I can see a Broadcom person here, and several other NIC vendors. It was a big pain to try to get everyone to agree that you need to be able to support Gen 5 and Gen 6 with the same insertion loss budget of what you're doing today with SFF. 
We already today, I can't get into a lot of, uh, of information here because PCI is a copyrighted information, but what I can tell you where we enhanced, we did tighten the insertion loss by 2 dB in comparison to the other particular spec. That is a big challenge. It, it pushes people into very expensive material. We, we define you know, colloquially as material as low loss material, ultra low loss material, which is about one dB per inch, and extreme low loss material, which is 0.8 dB per inch. And in many cases, especially for Gen 6, it's probably gonna have to force the NIC vendors to have to support extreme low loss. That is an unfortunate thing, but we all tend to agree that they're, from a cost point of view, if you're gonna have to do extreme low loss, it's easier to do it on a NIC card than it is to be doing on the bigger HPM cards. Um, you can just see from a square footage or square uh, inch, it, it's just more reasonable to enable, enable this sort of feature. It has to be done this way. With Gen 6, we have to also, we went ahead and wanted to introduce the informative limits. So this includes insertion loss, return loss, power sum, near and crosstalk, as well as far and crosstalk. Um, these are very compatible with not only the PCI specs, but also uh, uh, SNEA as well. We wanted to ensure that there was some conformality since our particular TA1002 connector shares uh, the, the SNEA specs within that. Um, all these are now part of the specification. They're all released um, in the latest 1.5, including as we're going for Gen 6, the SFF as well has also been included in this. And maybe one more thing here, the bottom left, I'll turn your attention to the CAD drawing. Right, as Joe mentioned, we ah, enabled yeah. a backplate, right? You want to take that away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, since we're talking about really tight specs here, even a half dB is, dB is important. So one of the challenges was we had to make a decision to keep that zone for that insulation. Um, you had to not allow the caps there. Now we do. It, it gains everyone a half dB, and I think that helped, you know, keep everyone settled here. Yeah, there was room for innovation here. So let's so. Uh, wrap it up. So the last thing today is our call to action. So the problem that we're trying to solve is enabling scalable infrastructure that will be good for both foundational NICs and smart NICs, right? For both AI, cloud, HPC, telecom edge markets, right? You can find more information as Jason has already alluded to. There's a presentation later today, same room about Gen 6 support tomorrow. Jason also has a presentation on timing. Yep. Uh, come visit us in Innovation Village and get involved. Since really use, come join. Yeah. Since join we use all your time, you can catch us in the Innovation <laughs> Village uh, yeah. to ask us these kind of questions. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, we need your thermal engineers. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Please send them to, to join. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.